and follow Jesus. So please give a great one love welcome for my friend, John Whitaker. All right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Thank you. It is good to be with you. And uh, yeah, I got a little podcast, a little YouTube. You can always check that out if you listen to those things. I, I just want to teach the Bible. I think that's kind of the one thing that God has called me to do. So if you like Bible teaching and you listen to podcasts, you can check that stuff out or you can check out my YouTube channel. It's just a way to put really Bible teaching into the hands of where people live. So that's kind of what I'm after on that. And uh, I love this theme, this back uh, to or back, in this case, from the future theme. Uh, I actually... I actually introduced my kids. You know, I'm a child of the 80s like Eric, and so Back to the Future is a big deal. So when my kids, you know, got like 10, 11, 12, um, we introduced them to several of the Back to the Future movies, and they didn't find them nearly as epic or awesome as we did, and I don't understand that. But it seemed the same case with a lot of the other, you know, 80s TV shows and other things we tried to introduce them to, and it's like, yeah, yeah, the A-team really was pretty cheesy. You're right, that... That was a cheesy one. And most of you in the room were like, A-team, what the heck is that? You'll have to go look it up, all right? Pretty cheesy, all right? Um, so love this theme. I love the dominant question that's really driving this series. And that question is, what would you tell you? What would you tell you? If you could, like, present you, could go back to past you and give past you some advice, knowing what's coming in the future, what would you tell past you? Or if you could even speculate a little bit and, and go, you know, like go into the future and then future you could come back to present you, what would future you possibly tell present you about what's coming down the road? What would you tell you? And the reason that, uh, this, that One Love is in this series is because sometimes you can be the best advice giver to yourself of anyone. And so this question, what would you tell you driving this series? And so... I want to just kind of piggyback on some of the things Eric said last week and, and basically say, Eric kind of focused on this idea of taking up your cross and following Jesus, and that sounds hard enough, and I want to actually tell you today, and it's actually harder than that. So be encouraged. Aren't you glad you came today, you know, and someone's going to bring a downer of a message. Hopefully it's not totally that by the time we're done. All right? Um, so got a picture. Take a look at this picture. Anyone recognize who that is? Okay, basketball coach, because he looks like it, or do we actually know who he is? Do we have any March Madness fans in the, in the room? No. Like, what is this place, you know? Like, no March Madness fans. All right, that's a, okay, good, good, good. March Madness is, is happening in, in like a week and a half. It's, it's kicking off, and all right. This is Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett's the coach of the Virginia Cavaliers. Virginia Cavaliers is one of the, the favorites to win the whole thing this year in uh, you know, March Madness and College Basketball Championship. So Tony Bennett is actually a follower of Jesus. And in the, the uh, mid to late 90s, Tony Bennett was playing in the NBA. Uh, he actually played for what was then the Charlotte Hornets. And so he was, he was uh, playing in the NBA. And during the offseason, this one particular year, he was rehabbing in Auckland New, Ze uh, Auckland, New Zealand. And so he's there in New Zealand where he meets a guy by the name of Jeff Vines. Jeff Vines and I had gone to grad school together, um, and Tony meets Jeff, and Jeff, invite, or, uh, Jeff invites Tony to help him get this church started that he's planning in Auckland, New Zealand. And, and, uh, and so Tony starts kind of helping out a little bit. The, uh, the, the season of basketball that he's kind of rehabbing in down there in New Zealand ends, and it's time to go back to the States to, to pick up the NBA season. And he has a, a $1.3 million one-season offer on the table from the Cleveland Cavaliers. So he leaves New Zealand to head back to the States um, to, to play basketball, it looks like, for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Well, before he leaves, Jeff says to Tony, he says, Tony, would you? You have so many connections and so much influence because of the platform God has given you. Would you consider coming back to New Zealand and helping me plant this church in Auckland? Well, Tony says, I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. And he leaves, right? This is the 90s. And so about six weeks later, uh, Jeff in New Zealand gets a fax. It's the 90s, all right? <clears throat> he gets a fax from Tony Bennett with a picture of the previous basketball season with Tony on top of the pile of his teammates after they won their playoff series. Um, and Tony has scribbled across the picture what we did here lasts a moment. What you're doing 
last for eternity. I'll be there as soon as I can. And Tony turns down a $1.3 million one-season offer from the Cavs to go help start a church in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, well, about a year or two after that, Jeff invites me to come down and do some preaching and teaching in Auckland, New Zealand, and I have the opportunity to meet Tony. Um, Tony's working with the youth at that time, and so I get to meet Tony Bennett. He probably doesn't remember me from Adam. Right? I can bump into him on a basketball court now. He doesn't remember me, but I remember him because, like, he's famous, and I'm not, right? So... <clears throat> um, so there he is, and I'm at one of the youth nights, and they have a basketball court, and so Tony's, you know, playing basketball with some of the teens, right? And, he, you know, and I've never seen a basketball move so fast in my entire life, which just speaks to the, really, the skill and the speed at which the NBA game is played. And so I grab a ball, and I back up to Tony, and I say, here, I'll post you up. We're both about the same height, about six foot. I'll say, I'll post you up. And he says, fine, we'll do it the NBA way. And all of a sudden, I get an elbow in the small of my back, and I get a knee in my tailbone, and I try to post up Tony Bennett. doesn't work out so well for me, right? Um, well, this is May and June in, in uh, New Zealand, and the NBA playoffs are on TV. And so I'm sitting in a, a living room with Tony Bennett watching the NBA playoffs, and he knows almost all these guys on the floor because he's played against them or he played with them. And so I asked Tony, I said, Tony, do you, do you ever miss, uh, you know, the grind of the NBA? Do you ever miss playing basketball in the NBA? And Tony's like, you know, he said, what I, what I miss are the playoffs. I miss the playoffs. But the rest of the season, the regular season, is such a long, grueling season. The rest of the season is such a long, grueling season. And I want you to have that language and that idea in mind for the text we're going to look at today. Because the text we're looking at today actually uses this imagery of like sports and athletics and this idea of it being a long, grueling season. So let's jump in. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, picking up in verse 1, says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now this passage is fairly well known. If you've ever spent much time in church, you may have heard this passage. It's fairly well known. And for a long time, I assumed this text was predominantly about the race. Run the race of faith, right? Like run that race of following Jesus. And it was about that. And it is, but that's really not its primary focal point. Um, and so I just want to go back through those verses, and I want you to see a repeated word that maybe you noticed as we read through it the first time that really is the focal point. Look at verse 1 again. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses uh, surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which entangles us, and let us run with endurance. endurance. Let us run with endurance. Endurance. You look at verse 2 and it's focused on Jesus and it says, Fix our eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured. Jesus endured. You look at verse 3 again and we, we go to verse 3 and it says, Again, for consider him, Jesus, who has endured. Three times in three verses, the word endurance or endured shows up. And that's the dominant theme of this text. That's the dominant theme of this passage is the idea of endurance, endure, endure. It's such a long, grueling season. And you're going to have to endure. You're going to have to run with endurance. It's, it's not just a sprint. It's a marathon. And there is a lot demanded of you. Now remember, this is focused on following Jesus. And following Jesus is therefore is going to require endurance. It's going to require you to endure. Why? Well, the word translated race in this text, I'm going to put it on the screen. This is the Greek word behind the word race. Agona in Greek. What does that sound like? It sounds like agony. Because that's the word we get our word agony from. 
And, and in the ancient world, this word could be used for literal, literal agony, a literal struggle, something that was hard and, and hurt, agony. Or more metaphorically, and this is more often the way it was used, for an athletic contest, an athletic event. Maybe it was a race. Maybe it was a wrestling match. Maybe it was a boxing match. They had all of those in the ancient world, right? And so they took this word struggle, contest, ego, na, and said, that's what we're dealing with. When we're dealing with the world of sports, when we're dealing with the world of athletics, we're dealing with ego, na, a contest, a struggle, something that's hard and difficult. And that's why the race of faith takes endurance. It's because it's ego, na. Um, this, this idea of this word, this is, this is say like, you know, it's the football player and now we've gone through the entire football season and it's the, the end of the season and we're approaching the playoffs and all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, the announcer talking about this linebacker or this running backer who's been, you know, battling through I injury and we've come to the playoffs, but this is the playoffs, man, and he can't sit out and so he's not in his best shape, he's pretty banged up, but he's battling through. That's what we're talking about by this word. Or, or we're talking about like the basketball player who's you know, got his ankle taped up or whatever and he's out on the court or it's Michael Jordan and the flu game, right? Like you're battling through. You're not, you're just gutting it out because it's hard. It's a struggle. In fact, when I think of this word and I think of sports, I actually think of my daughter. My daughter, back when she was like, you know, 13, 14, 15, she was actually a pretty phenomenal little soccer player. Um, very fast and good scorer and I actually coached her for eight years, and so she's 13 years old. We're having a phenomenal season. Uh, we've lost one game all season. It's the end of the season tournament, and obviously we're one of the favorites to win the whole thing. Um, well, in the gym, during lunch break at school, not on the soccer field, my daughter was fooling around with the ball and rolls her ankle. Rolls it bad, like it's one of the worst ankles I have ever seen in my life. Her ankle is just swollen, huge, uh, from toe halfway up her leg, deep purple, uh, black, blue, purple. I mean, it's bad. It's one of the worst looking ankles I've ever seen. It's like, we're coming into the, the playoffs. It's the end of the season tournament, you know? It's like, and we have this rivalry going with one team, the one team that beat us all season. And um, I'm one of the coaches of the team, and, 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 you know, we have to hold her out for the first game. We get to the semifinals, and it's like she wants to play so bad, and I'm dad, and I'm coach, and it's like I've never seen an ankle that looks like that. No, you can't play. Can't play. And she says, Dad, if we win this game and we make the finals, I'm playing. I'm playing. Well, we won the game, so we make the finals. So load her up with ibuprofen. Tape that ankle up the best we can and stick her out on the field. She scored 13 or 14 goals the whole season. We, we need her in the game anyhow, and she's determined to play. She can't move laterally at all because that ankle hurts so bad, but she can still run you know, north and south. Um, there was a moment in this, this championship game where man, it was one of those movie moments. There needed to be music in the background, right? You know, and, and we feed the ball through, and my daughter takes off, and I know the pain she's in. I know how, I mean, I've seen her wincing just walking around the house, but it doesn't matter. It's the championships. And she takes off after that ball, and she goes to take a shot, right? It's like, as a dad, you know, the pride, she's battling through, right? That's what the author of Hebrews is saying to us, that life following Jesus, the race of faith, it's ego, nah, it's battling through, it's a struggle, it's not always easy, it takes guts, it's hard, but that's what Jesus calls us to, to run the race of faith. So if you're, if you're, if you're sitting in the room today and you're, you're like maybe just checking out Jesus, maybe you've been here two or three Sundays and you're not even sure what you believe about Jesus, you're not even sure if you, you buy all this, but you're you maybe starting to warm up to it, just know. Just know it's not going to be easy. If you want to follow Jesus, it's going to take some guts. You're being called into something that's harder probably than you can imagine right now. You're being called into something that's going to take some courage. Do you have it? Do you have what it takes to follow Jesus? And if, if you're in the room and you've been following Jesus for a while, how have you experienced the ego nah, the struggle of following Jesus? Have you experienced it maybe in, in just the, the continual self-sacrifice to serve people when you don't feel like it? 
Have you experienced it perhaps in maybe some of the, the rejection you've experienced from people that you had hoped would treat you differently? Have you experienced it because you've been overlooked for promotions, maybe on the job because there's certain things you're just not going to do on your job? How have you experienced the agony, the struggle, the difficulty of following Jesus? Now, where do you get the ability to endure? In the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the difficulty, where do you get the ability to actually run the race with endurance? I can tell you this. It's not just going to happen on accident. It's not just going to happen by trying, right? Like, I'm just going to try hard. It doesn't happen by trying. It doesn't happen on accident. You don't just drift into being able to run with endurance. Um, I, I mean, I know that for a fact, like just personally, and again, from the world of athletics, silly story, but it, it illustrates this idea of it doesn't just happen, right, like on accident. Uh, <clears throat> I was a pretty good athlete back in the day. I was pretty fast. I had a lot of good basic athletic ability. I uh, went to college, went to grad school. Grad school was very demanding, so I didn't work out, didn't exercise, didn't play any sports for like three years, pretty much sat around and studied and read books for like three years. Um, get done with grad school, move back to Boise, Idaho, start going to a church. This church had a, a church softball team, so I'm going to play softball. In my mind, I remember the glory years, <clears throat> right? Um, and so I'm playing softball. I used to be quite fast. Uh, you know, I could cover the whole outfield. I had a solid arm. So, you know, I, I put myself back out in, in center field because that's what I always used to play, and it worked great back in the day, right? So there I am out in center field. It's a short pop fly, you know, right over second base. Oh, no problem. So I start going for the ball, um, and I realize, oh, I'm going to have to go a little faster to get to that ball. Uh, so it's like, okay, I'm going to have to downshift, find that extra gear, go get that ball. So I try to downshift and try to take off. That gear is gone. I don't know what happened to it in grad school, but that gear was gone, and there's nothing left. I'm trying to run faster. I'm trying to run faster, and I'm trying with everything I've got. Right? I'm trying hard, uh, and that gear is just totally gone, and literally, I start to stumble forward. I never get my hands out in front of me. I fall flat on my face, never get to the ball, fall flat on my face. My wife is over on the sidelines laughing hysterically at her husband who just made a fool of himself. And I get up, and I can't see this, but she can. And she tells me afterwards, do you realize you played the rest of the game with a grass stain <laughs> right on your forehead? Because you, I landed right on my forehead. It didn't matter how hard I wanted to. It didn't matter how hard I tried, right? I wasn't getting to that ball because I wasn't prepared. I hadn't trained. And if you want to run the race of faith with endurance, it's not going to happen because you try hard enough. It's not just going to happen because you want to so bad. It's going to happen because you're prepared. It's going to happen because you train, not because you try. Um, and you actually see this in this text. Look again at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, and let us lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the agonah, the struggle, the race that is set before us. Notice what he says, let us lay aside every encumbrance. That speaks of preparation. Not just trying, but preparation. Let us lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us. Again, those words speak of training, not trying. They speak of being prepared, like you've, you've planned, you've worked, you've trained, you've given effort, and now you're ready to run with endurance because you are prepared and trained to do this. Not just because you want to, and not just because you're trying to. You've trained for it. Um, <clears throat> I have a buddy by the name of Travis Jacob. Travis used to work with me at Boise Bible College. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he was an avid bike rider. So here's Travis with his bike getting ready to ride. Now, you, this may not impress you, but I'll explain it. Getting ready to ride from Boise, Idaho to McCall, Idaho. Now, McCall, Idaho is a mountain town. It's a two hour drive by car away, it's 110 miles from Boise, uphill, because it's a mountain town sitting at about 5,000 feet in elevation. Travis is going to get on his bike 
and ride to Macau in one day. In one day. And then the next day, he's going to turn around and ride back home to Boise. Which, all right, at least there's some downhill on that, right? That's true. But then right at the end, you're 20, you're 20 miles from home, right? Like you're almost there. And there's a six-mile-long, 7%-grade hill that he has to ride up to finish getting back home. <clears throat> um, now, let me just ask you, could you hop on a bike today? And ride that ride? Yeah, me neither. I might be able to go three miles. Maybe if I push it five, but I'm not going 110 uphill into the mountains on a narrow winding road next to a river with cars zipping by. But Travis could because Travis had prepared for it. Travis had trained for it. <clears throat> Travis was ready to do it. Yeah, it took effort, it took work, it was a struggle, but he was actually prepared to do it because he had trained to do it. It wasn't like he just woke up one morning and said, I think I'll just try to ride to McCall today. He had prepared and trained for it. And the same is true in the life of faith. If we're going to follow Jesus to the end, if we're going to run the race with endurance, it's not going to happen on accident. It's not going to happen by trying or wanting to. It's going to happen because you train for it. You train for it. So back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> and I want to look at these phrases again. This, let us run with endurance. Can we put it up here? Let us run with endurance the race. How? Because we, we have set aside or we've laid aside every encumbrance. We've laid aside every encumbrance. And the word encumbrance refers to things that aren't, aren't like <clears throat> wrong per se. They're not bad things. They're just, they're just obstacles. They're just hindrances. They're just barriers, things that get a little bit in the way. Can you imagine Travis wearing heavy, bulky clothing making that ride? Can you imagine Travis with like huge saddlebags on the side of his bike full of water bottles and snacks making that ride? No, Travis is riding a light bike wearing lightweight clothing to make that ride. He's laid aside every encumbrance. And if we want to run the race of faith well, we need to lay aside all those distractions. They're not necessarily sinful things. They're not bad things. They're not wrong things. They're just things that get in the way. Maybe, maybe it's the amount of time it's been scrolling. I don't have time to read my Bible and pray. <clears throat> maybe, maybe it's a certain relationship where the relationship itself isn't bad, but for whatever reason, that person just drags you away from Jesus, not towards Jesus. And it's like, right now, I just don't have the strength to be in that relationship because it's, it's an encumbrance. It's hindering me and taking me away from it. Maybe it's the amount of entertainment or the kind of entertainment or the amount of recreation and the kind of recreation. Things that aren't in and of themselves wrong, per se, but they get in the way. They become barriers, obstacles, hindrances, dead weight that you just can't carry on this race of faith if you're going to run with endurance. So let us lay aside every encumbrance. And let us lay aside the sin which so easily entangles and trips us up. And that idea of the sin that trips us up, sin is, is things that Jesus says is wrong. Things, things that Jesus says isn't good for you. Things that Jesus says isn't helpful to you. So you're, you're going to be running with endurance because you've laid aside the sin. Which, which by the way, <clears throat> when Jesus deems certain things wrong, it's not arbitrary. It's not like Jesus is just randomly, you know, picking things to label wrong to spoil your fun. When Jesus says something is wrong, when something is labeled sin or wrong, it's actually because it's the way you're designed to work. Like, for example, would you put water in the gas tank of your car? It's going to ruin your motor. Why? Because your car is not designed to run on water. It's designed to run on gasoline. Or would you put Hershey syrup in your crankcase? if you know what a crankcase is. <laughs> well, crankcase is where your oil goes. And just because oil is sort of a, a thick, brownie-looking liquid doesn't mean it, you, know, you can just put Hershey syrup in there because it's also a thick, brownie-looking liquid. Your car is not designed to run, be lubricated by, by Hershey syrup. It's designed to be lubricated by oil. Um, well, when Jesus says certain things are wrong, it's because you're designed to work a certain way. You're not designed to run on hate and indifference. You're designed to run on love. 
You're not designed to run on anger and mean-spiritedness. You're designed to run on peace and patience and kindness, right? So when Jesus deems certain things wrong, it's because of the way you're designed to function. And Jesus, or the, the author says here, is if you want to run the race with endurance, you're going to have to lay aside those things that are poisoning your system and are not helping you work the way you're designed to work. So if you want to run with endurance, it's going to happen because you're prepared, because you've trained, because you've laid aside every encumbrance and the sin that's entangling you. So what do you need to lay aside to follow Jesus to the finish line? What do you need to lay aside to run the race with endurance? Are you prepared to finish well? Are you ready to run with endurance? And the reality is, at this stage of my life, um, looking back at past me, the message of this text is definitely something present me would go back to past me if I could and tell me. Because <clears throat> I'll be 50 in about two months, exactly two months from today, May 10th, I'll be 50. Um, and when I was young, when I was 20-year-old John in college, I was so excited to follow Jesus, and I was so enthusiastic about it. I had big dreams of ministry and big dreams of service to Jesus. But now, 30 years later, I know it's not going to be nearly as easy as I thought it would be. And if present me could go back to 20-year-old past me, I would put my, my hand on my shoulder and I would say, John, it's going to be a whole lot harder than you think. It's not going to be as fun or as easy as you think. Those big dreams, I'm glad you have them, John. But just know, some of them aren't going to come true. Some of them are going to be dashed against the rocks of hardship. It's not going to be as easy as you think. And if you're, if you're in the room, you're 20, 21, 22, please hear my heart in that. If you want to be faithful to Jesus, it's going to take more courage, more guts than you probably realize right now. But it's worth it. It's worth it. So don't give up. Don't quit. Run the race with endurance. When life is hard and you're disappointed and you feel like giving up, don't quit. Run the race with endurance. What do you need at this stage in your life? What do you need to lay aside to be prepared to actually say, I'm going to make it to the finish line, even if I get there limping across? Now, where do you get the motivation to do that? Because that's, that's a hard message to tell past me. That's maybe a hard message to tell present 20, 21, 22-year-old you. Where do you get the motivation to, to hang in there when you feel like, man, this is not working out the way I thought. Man, life didn't turn out the way I wish it would. I thought by this time in my life I would be at a different stage. I thought my kids would. I thought my grandkids would. Where do you get the motivation to hang in there? when life is hard and disappointing and you experience the ego nah of following Jesus. Where do you get the motivation to do that? Let me show you. Hebrews 12, 3 says, consider him. Consider him. Fill your mind with him. Focus your attention on him. Who's him? It's Jesus. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Where do you get the motivation? By considering him, by focusing your attention on him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Or again, verse two puts it this way, fixing our eyes on Jesus, setting the focus of our gaze on Jesus, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Where do you get the motivation? You get the motivation by fixing your gaze on Jesus. So there's Jesus being rejected by the very people who should have been most ready to welcome him. There's Jesus being stabbed in the back 
by some of his closest friends. There's Jesus enduring abuse of an illegal, unjust trial on trumped up charges. There's Jesus being whipped and beaten, bloody and broken. There's Jesus with nails being driven through his wrists and his feet for you and for me because he literally loved you to death. Fix your eyes on Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. One of my heroes was speaking in chapel, his last chapel when I was in Bible college as he was retiring. He was old, he was wrinkled, he was kind of hunched over. Um, <clears throat> and he, he was giving his final talk as he retired from a life of service to Jesus and he had suffered he had been in motorcycle accidents and car accidents on trails in the jungles of Brazil. He had lost children to disease because of trying to follow Jesus, and that's hard. Um, he had poured out his life in various organizations, so here he is standing, standing, giving his final message. At the end of his message, with tears running down his cheek and his chin quivering from emotion, he says, my life has been one big song of thank you. And I would like to think that maybe that's what future self would say to present me. John, hang in there. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because it's worth it. It's worth it. And he loved you so much that he endured the cross. So just because of grateful love, Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep going, even if it means you crawl or limp across the finish line. Don't quit. Don't quit. Run the race with endurance, fixing your gaze on Jesus. Let's pray. God, we, everything we are, everything we hope to be, is a gift of your love and your grace. So thank you for Jesus. And thank you for what, what he did on our behalf. The courage he showed, the backbone he showed, the love and the grace he showed, laying down his life for us. Jesus, thank you for everything you've done for us. May you give us courage and strength to imitate you until the final day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, good, good stuff. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hey, uh, we're about to let you go here in a minute, uh, but before I do, I want to point you your uh, direction. If you do need uh, prayer, over to my right, we have a, an amazing prayer team that would love to get to know you. Also, if you're thinking, man, that, that's, that's some good stuff, fixing my eyes on the author and perfecter of my faith, enduring, but what's my next step? If you're in here this morning and you're thinking through, man, what's my next step? We would love to meet you at the, uh, the guest services uh, table, which will have the, um, the One Love bags on those, and would, would love to help you with your, with your next steps. For the rest of us, may we continue to fix our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith and even crawl towards that finish line if, we, if need be. Have a great week, and we'll see you for part three of Back from the Future next week. Bye, guys.